how do you see, this is really to anybody, um, the evaluation and figuring out should I do a um, mobile web app or an app? Like, with, you know, you're working on, on an app. You know, how do you make that decision? What are the factors? Very carefully. <laughs> I, I would actually, I would say that probably the best thing to do would be by the agency of resources and time. Um, I know that I'm handling, I'm the webmaster for Department of State. And I'm lucky enough to have an artist designer help me with the Photoshop time and, and design stuff, which I actually prefer doing. But uh, now I'm doing the code and doing that aspect of it. But you really need to have the resources of IT department and who's going to develop and get the supervisory approval to look at it. Um, I'm very fortunate that at Department of State, with the number of websites we have to maintain, that because I have an artist designer who can also code, I'm able to take the time to make presentations and look at these things and be aware that maybe we need to be making more apps. I think, or maybe making an app, um, the best thing that happened, like I said, was when I met with a security guy and he basically told me about global payment services and uh, that most of the state is contracting with them to handle their, their, uh, their finances in terms of you know, charging for fees and, and uh, that aspect of it. And probably one of the best things you can get is to start with making your website more mobile, web friendly to start there and see if there's things that are missing that you're not able to hit and maybe make your application out of that. I think one of the harder aspects of that is as I <coughs> as a, as a um, we were talking about the OFT and the forms, I just look at it as a way to authenticate. To me it looks like that's our answer. But uh, we're still pretty far off from that. I mean, if it was one of the cases where we could have our, imagine if you could just fill out an online form and you're going through your vendor, whoever your vendor is, Verizon, AT&T, but they're verifying that you're using that mobile device and that you're authorized to go ahead and, and pay for things, pay for your pay for your fees to be a uh, hairdresser, whatever, whatever, whatever your application is licensed, whatever your agency has to have that inter interaction with the public. So that's where I would suggest to do, not dodging the answer, but really it's pretty much one of those things you have to really look at it from throughout the time and resources and what's not being met. If I start the process, I have a full month before they're going to recognize me. <laughs> so it's a good thing to look at to, to start the process and then you might get to the point where you go, you know, no, we're just going to change it with the website. And then by then Apple probably still hasn't gotten back to you yet. So you don't have to worry about it. Got a lot to do with the, the customer base, who we're trying to reach. You know, we, we're going to talk about the, the 501 mobile app, but they're in the same project, we actually created a mobile web too, um, above and beyond the dot org site, you know, where it was programmed and designed especially for a mobile browser. You know, and we did that because you know there's still quite a few people out there with old phones. I'm one of them. That's not you know a smartphone that can do that. So I can still access the same information via my mobile web phone versus when I was smart. So we decided to do both because a lot of the you know, audience that we're trying to reach is so maintaining that old technology. And a mobile website doesn't doesn't mess with the app stores or anything else. Right. So you can code it pretty much yourself without any you know, additional uh, outside intervention licensing. Yeah, that's a good question, and kind of, kind of lead right into that. I'm Anthony Devonis, and thanks for having me. But uh, what I was going to do is just uh, talk about devices in general, talk about my thought process on how I approach this new mobile development space, and my experiences, and um, then show how you could build an app actually pretty easily compared to what I could do six months ago. It's definitely, uh, let's see, uh, is there a uh, oh, during the presentation? I'm like the most annoying person at the party today, <laughs> <laughs> which isn't unusual. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I'm not 
one, one thing you'll find about how I approach this is I don't tend to be one of those people who picks one thing and say, that's what I'm going to do, and that's the way it is. I'm always looking for the next best degree way of doing things. If it's easier, better, faster, uh, it's going to work for more people. And I do love these mobile websites that are optimized that I can go to quick, get my information I need, and move on. Um, I also find that these sites work differently on different devices. And even any of the stuff that I started playing with, one of the first things I started doing uh, is following the, the, you know, I'm an Apple guy too. Uh, I've had Apples for many years, uh, from college on. And I found that the emulators that you have to, to play with your application and you get usually with the tools will only give you a little bit of what the experience is like. And I don't have an iPhone, so do I go buy an iPhone and I have to get another phone line and test this out? You have to be creative, and you got to get try to get your hands on as many devices or friends that have devices that'll let you plug them in. Um, but you don't necessarily need a whole a whole iPhone um, like the iPad Touch, and this is a, you know over a year old, and I can still run tons of stuff on it and do a lot of uh, testing on this iPod Touch. Um, so you don't necessarily need a full phone. Um, what I also have is an array of different devices here that if you haven't touched them and played around with this stuff, um, you can go ahead and the phone is ringing, that you can um, go ahead and play with and, and touch these things. Um, there's an I, uh, iPad up here that uh, I can demonstrate some stuff. There's a, a Blackberry, there's a, a Droid, um, and there's also uh, a Google TV device, which is a uh, you know, one of the slides had a uh, the, mo the wireless home appliance. Well, here's the one that I you know really looking forward to playing with. Um, it's a wireless keyboard from Logitech. Has a built-in mouse. Has a new five-way controller that if you dealt with single clicks and double clicks, now you have to deal with gestures and, and multi-finger scrolling. But also, which of the five buttons did they did the user potentially click on their TV? So, the amount of testing we have to do for these apps have, has grown uh, grown exponentially. And what I what I heard uh, out of the conference was, um, and, and I've been hearing and seeing mobile stuff for, for many years here, but I think finally we're here. And what they're recommending is to, if you've got a brand new project to work on, think mobile first. Think about what it's going to be. Is it going to be a web-based app? Is it going to use jQuery mobile, which is really cool stuff? Um, do you need to write an application for the phone? And then maybe think about the TV second. How, what features would you add or take away to have it work on a TV if you need to support a TV? And then your second, your third design pass would be for the desktop, your browser, those type of things. And, and what I'm finding is you can just layer technology and lay, layer features on. So a lot of my mindset is on features, being able to turn features on and off uh, based on the device. And if you keep thinking that way, you'll set yourself up for success. So um, these devices are here. If you want to play with them, um, go ahead. And So I started out with Xcode developing for the, um, the iPod Touch. I got a, a, an application running on the phone, no problem. And then I got the iPad and I wanted to see how it worked on that. And I had to reformat some things. It, it, it'll run on the iPad, but it stretches everything out. So having the iPad physically in my hand that I can deploy to, it was very easy to deploy to it uh, after you go through the rigors of, I felt that pain, made the money, you know, um, and I'm, I'm not a, a C++, uh, C Sharp, or uh, kind of developer, but I am a Java developer. So when Android came out, I said, geez, you know, that's something I could probably do with my eyes closed. And so I got my hands on the um, Android developer toolkit, which is free, and it takes about uh, 10 minutes to download, there's no registration. It's a direct opposite of what Apple makes you go through. But they both have their, they both have their advantages. 
Um, so I didn't want to give up on, on the Apple stuff yet, but I did find I did enjoy working with the, um, the, the Android phone, although it doesn't have the same feel in, in your hand that the nice iPhone has. It definitely, they've got the, the look and feel of the phone and the responsiveness is really nice in the, in the iPhone and the iPod Touch, uh, the iPad too. But the Android gives me a, a lot of capabilities. And as a Java developer, like I said, I could easily develop and deploy to it. But what I found was, you know, the code was complex. And just connecting to a web service and getting some XML back, and knowing all the different possible scenarios and things that you can capture data in Java, uh, the collections, vectors, hashes, and, and trying to figure out what would work great on the phone. I think that's just too too hard, and, and I'm stuck with the Android. I can't support, so do I write two applications? And then I started looking at Titanium, uh, the app accelerator. I looked at um, pretty much any of the, the um, tools that you could look at for developing mobile apps. There's PhoneGap is another one that will allow you to code, code it once and deploy to multiple applications. And I think that has a lot of uh, possibilities. I do like, um, uh, Titanium seems to have a lot of capabilities. If you're a JavaScript developer, you do a lot of JavaScript. And you can deploy to the iPhone, you can deploy to the um, Android. Um, I think they're, they for Blackberry now, I believe. Um, and, and a bunch of other devices. So that's, that's really neat. Um, Adobe came out with their solution. And um, I'm also a Flex developer. I'm like, well, let me try that. I mean, let me see if that's going to work. And so I'm still weighing which technology I would bring to bear. But, um, and I, I'll, I'll show you some code. That's one of the things I want to do, is show you some code. We'll develop a little mobile app, see how long it takes to get it on a device. And then I'll show you another app that's about ready. It's going through final testing, going to be deployed to the Android market, and then soon after will be uh, deployed on BlackBerry and iPhones. So. Um, it's, it's not a government app, but it, most of the stuff that I've done in sort of mobile space, I, I can't show. It's either for somebody or NDA, or it's a government uh, type project that uh, is under wraps. And so I, I found something I can show that we've developed. So actually, that, I want to actually show you some real stuff. And when you talk about, do I develop a web-based app, or do I develop an application, I also try to think, I don't want to pinch and hold myself into one or the other. So I want to show you a workflow that I think kind of blends things together. Um, it still would be a lot of code if you wrote it all yourself, but um, ha has anybody done any geocoding here? Uh, uh, geocaching. Not coding, that's different. Geocaching. Geocaching is kind of neat. Kids love it, but you know, adults get into it too. And basically, people, uh, there's a free website, geocache.com. And they'll take a box, like an ammo box or some kind of weather type box. Uh, it could be a little, little, little small container. And they'll put them somewhere, usually at the top of a mountain. But I'm sure in this area, maybe even inside the museum, there's a geocache. Uh, although inside the buildings, it's tough because you need a GPS device. And a lot of phones have GPS enabled. So they can uh, hone in on where this thing is. And they'll give you little clues. And boy, they're hidden in little crevices and weird places. And you, uh, you open it up, and there's usually a logbook in there, and the kids can, can drop off something like a coin, and they can pick something up, like stickers or something, and, and they love it. And you learn how to use a GPS really well. 